Hello everyone. Bonsoir tout le monde. So tonight we're really excited. We're meeting with Sarah Larby uh, for some live FAQs. And what's the topic tonight, Jennifer? We're talking about how to get started. So how to get started in real estate. Yes. So really cool topic. I mean, we haven't spoken about this in a while, how to get started. So at some point, yeah, you just, you become, um, I guess, more advanced and then you forget the basics. So I thought, let's talk about how you get started and Sarah her and a coach. So I'm sure she comes across this question a lot and she'll have some amazing insights. Yeah, I really want to so, hear how she got good started. Evening. Hello. <laughs> Hello. You know, I have a, a special guest with me today. I don't know how much she wants to be on here, but Ah, hello, hello. Matt. Matt. Uh, this is like the amount of the amount of French that he knows. C'est tout. I don't know. Yeah, oh, yeah. that's, that's it. More Matt. Everything is better in French. Yes, that's exactly Wine? Wine, yeah. Unfortunately I'm tonight I'm just um... drinking water. Yes. Uh, on the wine today. Ah, oh, but it's nice to see your partner in crime. That's yes. great. I know that that's does exist. <laughs> yes, we were kind of starting to wonder a little bit. No? I, 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 I've only heard you in the background and I think I saw a hand once or something. I'm like, it's a fake, like maybe she's got a... Like the, the neighbor in Tim the Tool Man. Uh, yes. Home Improvements. <laughs> yeah. Fans, yeah, you never see. Curious one that just shows up once in a while. Like he's, he's been to the right club a few times, but he was when we had the bar, just at the bar. Oh, oh, well, that's okay. a good spot. He knows yes. where the good spot is. He's a smart guy. He's using his time wisely. <laughs> <laughs> Not for networking, just for drinking. <laughs> oh, yeah. But you listen in, so that's good. Yeah, I listen. I hear you. I've heard your voice before. There okay. you go. <laughs> Francois and Jennifer. Yes. Nice. nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. And, so and that's first Instagram live. Yeah. Oh, Whoa. Wow. There you go. <laughs> Nice. That's the best time for hairdos. Well, yep. right now, unfortunately, it is what it is because there's no barber shop. So yeah. mine's getting really pussy, but too yeah. bad. <laughs> black black market barber shops. Yeah, that's smart. I I know. I've noticed some people had all the fades and everything. I'm like, how are you doing it? <laughs> hey, it's what you gotta do. You gotta do what you gotta do sometimes, right? So yes. I have cut his hair a few times during confinement, but it's not always that great. Thank God for Zoom. It's a little bit far away. <laughs> yeah, yeah, like, thank goodness I don't see anybody for another month. Then it's going to grow back. <laughs> All right. So what is the topic of tonight? We're, start, we're talking about getting started. Yes. Started in, in real estate. All yeah. right. Cool. So, so I think what we want to do is just cover some of the different ways that people can buy their first investment property. Yeah, absolutely. And maybe you can tell, tell everyone how you kind of got started. Yeah, sure. Well, we actually got started by doing the hard way and saving and renting out to family, his sister. Yeah. <laughs> um, but there's lots of other ways that, you know, you can get started and, uh, you know, saving the 20% down isn't always the, uh, the one all and be all. So what about you guys? Um, so yeah, my mom was my, our first tenant mm -hmm. and actually the, the down payment, that's the good story. I didn't tell you on the podcast, but we'll say it tonight. The down payment came, I think maybe I've told you before, but it came from a, um, penalty. a penalty. So we sold what? the house and we had a major penalty. It was in Quebec and in Quebec oh. it's a notary and anyway. We didn't even know that there was this huge penalty, but we were just sitting there and they just announced it even in front of the buyers of our house. It was really kind of weird. That's how they do it in Quebec is with a notary in front of everybody. They're oh. like, Ooh, you guys really got laid with a big penalty. We're, we're like, like, thanks. <laughs> and then we found out we had 90 days to buy something else and we could recoup the penalty. So the penalty served as most of our down payment, half of it. Yeah. So that was kind of the crazy story. Uh, we had to came, come up with fifteen thousand uh, dollars because it was twenty five k the down payment, and I lost my job when we closed a few days oh, after. Oh. It was great. So <laughs> had you lost your job after you closed? Yeah, just after the day before. The day actually. before, yes. Yeah, so I had kind of lied. Oh yeah, we're all good. Yes, yes, and then <laughs> we got the property. <laughs> so yeah. 
Cool. Well, so they have, you guys have three, 30 doors right now, right? Yes. yes. In the last 19 months. Yes. Oh, that's pretty cool. Congrats. Yeah. It's been a, quite a ride. So, I mean, we didn't always use penalties as, as a <laughs> <No>. <laughs> start up. But we have been using other people's money, like you had mentioned uh, previously. And someone just asked the question, what was the penalty for? So when you break your mortgage uh, before the term, so usually the term's about five years, um, you have a penalty uh, of doing that. So it could be a dif differential penalty, which is usually... The bad high. one. Yes, it's <laughs> bad. Or if it's a very variable uh, interest three. rate, it's usually three months of interest. So that's not so bad. <laughs> this one was 10000 So mm -hmm. at that time, it was big for us. And now we have a 20K penalty and we're like, yeah, whatever. It could be offset somewhere else. <laughs> yeah, no, that's cool. And I think, I think that's something probably more, is that more in Quebec that you, you would use that? Uh, no, but in Quebec, what happens is when, first of all, it's a notary and everything's open. So they have to talk about your relationship. Are we married? Are we divorced? Where do the funds come from? How much of a mortgage do you have? And your penalty and everything, just like... Um, it's really weird. It's like you're doing your dirty laundry in public. It's very <laughs> strange. Like even them, we had to learn about. That they were common law and that it was him that was bringing in the deposit. And if they separated, he would get his deposit back. Like, so it was kind of, like, kind of weird. But we are kind of getting off topic. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it was a little bit strange. But like now we also have a penalty. We sold a property. But now we're just going to use the mortgage amount, the available mortgage amount for another property. And then they'll give us back our penalty. So yeah, it's a portable mortgage. So, mm -hmm. so if you buy some something else, then you get that back. Yes, yes, exactly. Very cool. All right. So what are some other ways? And oh, hey, there's Chuck. Look, you know Chuck. Chuck, what's going on? <laughs> Matt, Matt knows. <laughs> oh, that's good. So you guys kind of pulled together your your first deposit, the twenty percent, to buy your first place together. Yeah, but it it was a one hundred and thirty thousand dollar house. Oh, oh, okay, wow. cool. Like our condo, our condo was 125, so. It was like mm. 400 square feet, and it was, it's from the 1850s, like the crappiest house. I don't know how people live there, but somehow yeah. the tenant now made it like, like awesome. Like it looks like an HGTV house. Cool. Wow, that's so cool. As a brick foundation, it was really, wow. really old, yeah. But it's, uh, yeah, it's come together nicely. And it's gone up oh, wow. in value quite a bit, mm. I assume. Yeah, I mean, it because it's so small, like it is so small, like it'll never like have as much lift as like a normal size house. <laughs> but, yeah. But it's probably worth like maybe 400 today. Wow. And that was seven years ago. Oh, that's a great uh, way to have started out 130 now up to 400,000. Yeah. It's mm. not bad. It's not bad. But I will say like, so like, you know, that's how I started. I started saving. You guys use your, your penalty. Um, but you know, you could, you can start with joint ventures. You can actually start with HELOCs. Like a lot of people yeah. are sitting on a ton of equity from their primary residence that oh, hi, yes. we didn't know at the time, but you can unlock that amount and you can use that cash and deploy into buying other properties. And so I think like it was probably like our, our second and a half or third property that we started utilizing our equity in our property. Oh, wow. So, oh, cool. Did it the hard way for all those properties, <laughs> oh my. Yeah, no, it's so oh, true. I, I had a conversation with someone, a million dollars in equity. I'm like, you need to do something, make some yes. calls right now. Put it to use, it's, and it doesn't have to be HELOC. It could just be a line of credit. Yeah, it's dead money. All right, here's a question for Matt. I'm gonna put him on the spot, because he just said he, yes. knows, he knows nothing. <laughs> but I'm sure he knows. There you go. If, if somebody wants to get started, in real estate investing, what do you think they could do to start? <laughs> oh boy. Have I taught you anything? <laughs> <laughs> is there a disclaimer here? <laughs> disclaimer is We're not responsible for, for Matt's answer. We're for yes. no <laughs> but, but just curious, like if somebody wants to get started and let's just say they want to figure out, you know, a way to buy their first house, what do you think they should do? I would go on the sarahlarby.com website and, uh, Hire her for some coaching, and I think you'd be in good shape. What a smart okay. guy. <laughs> Very good. Like, That's oh, how you stay out of trouble. Yeah, that was so smooth. <laughs> yes. 
So we had a question here. What is the typical percentage of an OPM loan? Sarah, what's your experience? So I think if they are, so OPM stands for other people's money. Um, I think if they're doing this for a living, most people will do a first or second mortgage up to 80% loan to value. And then you still have to come up with a 20%. However, if you do have a friend or like somebody that you know personally, that might not be in like the hard money, private money game per se, you know, they could go up to higher. Like I've had uh, an investment property that did 100% loan to value. And all we had to do is rental costs. So, you know, it, it really is dependent on um, who you're actually approaching. A lot of people, you know, have lots of money in there and they want to loan it out. And some people are going to be more risk averse than others. Um, if it's registered money versus not registered money, there, there are going to be some uh, rules and regulations around how much loan to value something that can be like an RSP registered funds can, can go up to, I believe it's 95%. Um, but somebody like me, for example, like I will, if I know the property, I'll go up to 95% loan to value for, you know, students that I have and that I work with. But, you know, I wouldn't recommend that one of my students do any more than 80% loan to value. So that would probably mm -hmm. be my recommendation. But what about you guys? Yeah, I, mean, I think it, it totally depends on who you're talking with, their level of comfort, yes. and their level of experience as well. Because if they, like you said, you wouldn't re recommend it to your students because they don't have as much experience. And you never want to borrow from someone their last dollars. So let's say it's $50,000. You don't want to borrow their last 50K. Like, because then it gets very stressful and yeah, not good. Mm -hmm. So normally you're dealing with someone that's got more more money. Mm -hmm. uh, interest rates vary between uh, six, six to, well, I've heard from Danielle, actually six to like 20%. I, personally, I would never pay that, but <laughs> that's okay. It's a mindset thing. I stop at 14. Would, that's like my limit. Otherwise, I'll I put my credit card. How much down you put and how quick, how quick you can get your project done. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Those are all really important factors. I mean, if you're doing a flip, you might be in a, willing to pay more interest because you know it's going to be short term or if you're doing a burr it's good shorter, shorter term. term well what we do is longer term mm -hmm. so it's not sustainable at 20 percent long term we're, <laughs> no. we're, we're gonna be i don't know yeah living in a tent somewhere <laughs> that's very that's very expensive very quickly but i will say like calvert home mortgage we have a podcast together tomorrow but they will take 20 grand down and they will fund everything else in terms of the like, you know, even if it's like up to 95% loan to value, or I think it's up to 80% 80, 80 loan to value of the after repair value that they'll fund up to. But yeah. all you got to do is 20 grand down, show that you've got the rest for the renos, um, and they fund the rest, which is which is pretty good. And it's like 15 and a half percent. But if you're in and out in like two months, that's it, then that's fine. Yeah, it's it could be totally worth it. That's it. That's all it depends on the strategy. Or if you know, you have a bank. So um, I know Claire Drage, who comes on often on the Right Club events, or even Dahlia. She often says, if the building's not bankable, that's where you close with private money, and then you finance. So you need to have a solid exit strategy at that price. Mm -hmm. so. Uh, so we have wait. another question, too. Typical average percent for property managers. That varies a lot, actually. I would say, like, kind of around the typical average would be, like, 8 to 10%. But I mean, some, it, it depends on the market. Like a lot of the, some markets are higher and some are lower. I don't know what your uh, experience is, Sarah. And Matt. Yes, <laughs> yes sorry. I'm I, totally forgetting you, Matt. <laughs> a property management fee. <laughs> well, it depends on your, uh, your budget. But, uh, you know, you want to do your research, obviously, and make sure it fits into your, uh, you know, you're not overexpending yourself and that fits into the budget, so. That's, that's a great thing. I'll, I'll think... let Sarah take this one. <laughs> <laughs> he, he did not want to do this, by the way. I was like over here on the side and I like turned the camera and I'm like, you're uh... Too bad. <laughs> <laughs> We're live. <laughs> and watching and listening from the sidelines. Um, no, but realistically, I do agree with you guys. It's usually around that 8% mark. However, the more properties you have, the more units you have, you can likely get it down, figure out what's included and not included though. But I would say like when I was talking to like Susan and Sue from Complete Properties, they're around that 7% mark. Um, mm, yeah. That's very reasonable. And then if you're going into multifamily properties and you're doing like 
uh, you know, a building or something along those lines, and it's going to be less than that 7% because it's, it's going to be by unit. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. And like you said, it's important to see what's included because <laughs> sometimes tenant placement can be really expensive. Yeah. yeah, that's it. You have to watch out for fees because sometimes they're cheaper. They're 6%, but then there's all kinds of other fees, which ends up being more than 8 or 10 So, yeah, make sure you read your contract very carefully. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Somebody says I put you on the spot. Yeah, I saw that. <laughs> Thanks for having my back. I'm going to have to pay for it later. <laughs> Matt, that's appreciative. <laughs> it's an opportunity to grow. You know what? Yeah. <laughs> You do it now, you stay quiet, eventually, who knows, maybe I'll be chatty a year from now. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Jennifer did not use to like any of these lives. Uh, when we started our mini live podcasting, like Wine and Real Estate, a year ago, mm -hmm. after attending Dave's <laughs> Bo's event, uh, we were like three minutes, we were struggling to get through three minutes of live <laughs> stuff. And now anyway, uh, now yeah, we can talk away. You guys are pros now. I can't even tell. Oh my yeah. goodness. I would say it's mostly him that likes to talk. <laughs> yeah. If I get paid to talk, so why not? Yes. But not tonight. <laughs> <laughs> so what else do, do we kind of have to think about when we're thinking of starting out? I mean, obviously, how you do, fund the deal is important and property management. That's a good um, point as well. And what's your why? I think it's a big one. Some people are like, I want to invest in real estate. Why? Why everybody's doing it? Well, that's not going to get you through when you have nasty tenants that just trashed your place or you have a million bills and you don't know how to pay them or <laughs> yeah, I think that's that a good one. It's like just, just understanding why you're doing real estate in the first place. But I, I think, I think just building your team too, like when you're starting, like your if you can build a team together as a mortgage broker, your lawyer, your paralegal and accountant, realtors that are local, your contractors, um, things come into place a lot easier for you. And I would say private money lenders, especially in these markets um, and, and depending on the strategy that you're going to be doing. But, you know, that is piece because they're going to ensure that, you, you know, at least they, they can guide you along the way. Yeah, that's so true. And supportive spouses. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I see. Hi, Nicole. So Nicole Elostin Lachapelle. What's really Nicole Lachapelle? <laughs> questions you guys have like let's take some questions from the audience like i mean it could actually yeah. be like anything real estate related it could be like our worst real estate experience it could be putting matt on the spot it could be, <laughs> yes <laughs> on the spot why not let's see what they got in there yeah ask matt anything <laughs> for his oh, first boy. time i haven't got him on my podcast yet i'm still working on it <laughs> <laughs> So we have someone who's asking, have you used the Smith maneuver on your properties? I haven't. That's a good one. That's a good one. Yeah. No, we haven't either uh, used the Smith uh, maneuver. We, we never get to it because it does take some time. So, I mean, normally we sell, well, I mean, it's only the big scaling is only in the past like 19, 20 months. So <laughs> it's not like we've had time. This takes time. But most of our properties have the STEP program as part of the mortgage. So it does build up. Uh, we do joint ventures. So uh, we have a bunch of questions now. Yes. Is this a good time to buy? You want to answer that, Sarah and Matt? Sure, Matt. Yeah, is it a good uh, time? Really. <laughs> <laughs> it's definitely, uh, I, would, I think I could answer this. It's definitely difficult right now. You got to be careful with the bidding wars and how many people are putting offers in. It's more, I think people looking for their, uh, permanent homes as opposed to investment properties. That's are. actually really good. <laughs> yeah, that's not so bad. Awesome. Sorry, I just passed yeah, up there. What, what just happened? <laughs> <laughs> well, you definitely have to think about your strategy nowadays. Like, I still think it's a good time to buy, but you have to uh, absolutely think about uh, how you're buying and, and where. Yes. And what, do you, what are three things that you look for in a deal? Cash flow, lift, which includes the ARV and um, I don't know if there's three things. I would just say cash flow and like just the value, which is the lift. And then I think just if it's going to fit in the in the portfolio, like if it's the if, if it fits my criteria for holding it long term. Mm -hmm. I think another thing that we often look at as well is saleability. Yes, I was burning. Is it, is it really good for resale? Because you never know if you're going to have to sell it, you know, or get rid of an asset quickly. 
I think that's something that we always look at as well. Yeah, what's our exit strategy? And sometimes exit means selling. <laughs> yeah. Does Calvert charge fees? Yes. Yes, it's 2%. Well, I mean, it varies on the deal, but I've yeah. seen 2% lender fees so far. Yeah, so it's two points. So a point, a point means that every $100,000 is 1000 for every 100 grand. Mm -hmm. Points okay. mean... You grant two hundred or for every hundred thousand to two thousand bucks. Yeah. Your properties are held in corporation or LTD? They're held in our personal names and some are in corpse. So we have both. What about you guys? Thanks. Yeah, in our <laughs> name, in corpse, or in corpse as beneficial owners. Yeah, sometimes we JV with our corp and have them in our personal name. For the mortgage qualification. So what's that called? A bear trust. Yeah. And then Matt, being in the same field of work as you can, you see doing 30 years, or would you want to retire early? Oh, yeah, because you're, you're a police officer. <clears throat> yes. So, yeah, do you want to, I know a lot of police men, like, do 20 years, and then they retire, or? Yeah, I got 10 years left, but I think in this day and age, I think most of us would like to leave early <laughs> with what's going on in the, in the climate, but, yeah, it's a pretty It's a good hard job. It's a good job and that's yeah, been good to me and it is rewarding to give back. But I mean, would I quit tomorrow if we could for sure and travel a bit and have a life, but obviously that's a little difficult right now as well. So, but yeah, you'll be traveling by <laughs> foot in the province. <laughs> I think we got a three to five year plan. Hopefully I can leave maybe five years early than my normal 30 years, but we'll see what happens. And it's definitely a hard job to quit right now with, with, with the way society is and it's a it's obviously a steady paycheck so yeah. we'll kind of, kind of play it by ear with COVID and see how that goes and yeah I think it's great what you mentioned though is having a three to five year plan like I think that that's something important even when you're starting out as well what's yes. your plan for five years ten years and down the line as well where do you see yourself do you like your job some people love their jobs there's nothing wrong with that mm -hmm. like I <laughs> I met a dentist. He's like, I want to be an investor, but I'm a dentist. I love pulling yeah. teeth or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> so. well, I, think, I think being a police officer was tough getting us going at the beginning because I would go to a lot of calls, obviously, with seeing the bad side of tenants. And yes. Whatever. So <laughs> I a little yeah, You got to see the real nightmare stories. <laughs> yeah. It actually took, what, two years? It took a couple it took years, It took a couple yeah. years when I'm like, I want to invest in real estate for him to, like, get on board because of, like, him dealing with all the bad tenants when they call the police. Oh, yeah. wow. That's and it did, uh, obviously, as we got into it, we went slowly house by house and got to help some really good people, which was kind of good for me, too, because I definitely, one thing I said when I got into this was I was not going to be a slumlord. No. Whatever I had to do to work with somebody and just uh, be the best landlords we could be to help them out. Like that was definitely something I wanted to, to be and strive for. So, cause obviously seeing it as a police officer, how bad it can be between landlords and tenants, I just definitely didn't want to be that way. So that That's helped. So nice. And yeah. And there is some abuse. I know a lot of, um, I know there's some tenant abuse versus the landlords, but there are bad landlords too. Oh, 100%. that's why like it's gone so sour and crazy. The best, the best stories that I like, and I won't get into too many details, but like, cause like you hear the stories, the best stories I like is when like Matt helps the landlords without them even knowing. So like some tenants like, will I don't know, you had a call or something one day and the tenants like, well, I'm going to try to like stay here as long as I can and like screw the landlord over because I don't want to be <laughs> And Matt's like, well, you know, they could do this and that, and then you're going to go into more trouble. And, you know, he's like, they're like, oh, okay, they can really do that. And then, and then they ended up leaving peacefully. And that wow. they know that that tenant was going to try to play the system. We could okay. give you an address, Matt, if you'd like. Yeah, do you want a nice, <laughs> nice trip? There's some really good wine, Sarah. You'd love it. And what else do you like? Some, there's some good donuts or... Yeah, yeah. That's great. Good donuts. That's so stereotypical. <laughs> No, but there's some good stuff. And there's a nice address, yeah, near Ottawa if you want to come by and scare someone. But anyway, next question. <laughs> Do you prefer buying from wholesalers or MLS? From anybody who has a good deal. <laughs> yes, we don't care where it comes from. <laughs> yeah. 
I'm, I'm, I'm good with both. I think most of our deals have come from the MLS, but I'll, I'll, if a deal is a deal, I don't care where it's from. Yeah. yeah absolutely. I would just say if you're buying from a wholesaler, just keep in mind that the fee, unless you're going with private money, but the fee is not going to be financed by the bank. <laughs> No. Yeah. And that's another question I had from one of my JV partners, and I didn't expect it at all. But let's say you do a joint venture. Some people that bring the deal do charge a fee. And then my, my uh, joint venture partner was told, well, you can't finance that amount. I'm like, what amount? He's like, the amount you're going to charge me. I'm like, I'm not charging you an amount. We're partners here. But <laughs> I didn't get what he was talking about. But yes, you can charge fees, like especially if it's a big building or a really big deal. So. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. says, if you share one worst experience you ever had in any of your deal. I actually shared last time. What's your worst experience of renting or being an investor or a landlord? This is going to be interesting, guys. <laughs> we had one house that was obviously a lot of wear and tear, just how many people lived there. But they were amazing tenants that always paid. But just a lot of wear and tear in the house needed a lot of work. And it just got to the point where they needed to be out of there to do anything with it, to sustain it. And we had to end up uh, selling the place because it was just a lot of repair where it just needed like someone to move out and just tear the place down and rebuild it from the inside. And I would oh, say <laughs> lost a lot of money probably on that. Well, no, we didn't because we bought it for 165 and sold it for 300. Well, like during the time, like mm -hmm. we were selling it and doing well, but like during the time it was just kind of got to the point where I think we just made a decision to sell it and it worked out well. We, we did well on the sale and then we ended up buying uh, some other properties. So sometimes I think you got to know when to cut your losses too and sell and it worked out well. And we moved those tenants into another place that was a little bit more uh, for their needs and it was a little newer and they were able to live there and there hasn't been any issues knock on wood. So I would just say <laughs> <That's good. laughs> one time we had to get rid of a place. It was a tough decision to do because you obviously don't want to sell, but yeah, sometimes. Yeah. Sometimes you have to make those decisions. So I would say, but I mean, really, that's not even that bad. But that's it's probably not that bad. The... I was thinking of Julina and Jason. Oh, sorry, I shouldn't say names. <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking of two of our tenants that were not that good. But I won't tell the story now. I just said their names. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we'll, on. On, we'll say it another time. <laughs> yes. We have Let's just stay on that having... note. If you're interviewing tenants and they are in a new relationship and haven't lived together yet, maybe be a little weary if you're going to lock them into a year or two. And if their teeth <laughs> looks like they're on drugs, <laughs> they're probably. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Look at teeth. Nice toothy smile. Yes. <laughs> Our that sob stories. For I'm very not working green, green guys with COVID. <laughs> or we put all of our tenant screening measures. But you know, we, I think we got off of that one pretty easy, but it could have gone sideways very fast. Oh boy! Wow. What about There's you guys? Who asked? Uh, have you sold any properties to start trading options? No. No. Guys, <laughs> no. in terms of like an experience, like a worse experience. Oh, a worse experience. Oh us! Oh man! Well, we do have sob stories. So yes. if you get a cute family, mom has no teeth, <laughs> but lots of kids, run. <laughs> Well, I think, I think that when you get a story where like we have to move tomorrow, yeah, um, the, they're always in a they're in a hurry for the place. It's usually a red flag. Yeah, and right now it's it's really hard with COVID. There's a lot of people that need to move very shortly, and it's not a sob story. It's just their reality. Let's say they got a job somewhere, and because of COVID, it's really hard and screening. But you have to be tough. Uh, we're not here to be friends. This is a business. So it's like Walmart. They don't give us a five finger discount. So <laughs> same thing here. So it sucks, but it's not. Easy. Yeah, it is a fine line. You got to go with your gut. Like it is nice to help people that are in need and need a place to live with their families. But you also got to go by your gut. And if you feel something's off, you got to listen to that because people will also drain you dry if they can and they can take advantage oh, of yeah. it. I mean, I think it's in, in Ontario is the only place where you're landlording and people can literally like destroy your property and blame, and you, for blame it. you for it and stay in the property <laughs> where yeah. if you went to Walmart and like broke something every day, I think that they'd stop letting You'd you see go. Matt soon. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, Matt would go to the Walmart and stop. <laughs> well, I, th I think it's good for people to know in 
and landlord tenant disputes, police really have no power. So like mm -hmm. we're going, we're going there to keep the peace and see what we can kind of do to help people out as best we can, but we really have no authority under that act. So it's yeah. something people should know as well that I the police really aren't going to save you. That's it's, really yeah, it's so true. Yeah. Police doesn't. Like, Anybody that's listening to this, the police cannot kick out your tenants. And I sure. think, I think most officers ask him for advice on the RTA right now. Yeah. Oh, really? Wow. <laughs> mm. That's how little, but that's how little they know about like yeah. residential tenancy exact. That's like, that's actually very scary. The yeah. only time we've been told by a par paralegal is if there's illegal like drug sales and stuff, you're not evicting the tenant, but you can remove the person because of illegal activities. That's what we were told and fire arson. So if you're uh, like pyromaniacs or someone, that's what our paralegal told us. I'm like, okay, <laughs> hopefully we don't get there. <laughs> yeah, I mean, obviously if it's a fire risk, you can go different routes if it's a danger to the community and stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, there's always like other, other acts that- Gray areas. <laughs> like, but like the Tenant Protection Act and the Residential Tenancies Act, I guess is what it's called now. There's really not much we can do if it's just that issue on its own. Like obviously if there's a danger to people then other acts kick in or the criminal code or whatever, but it is a difficult thing for police officers to attend and and like when there people haven't paid rent in forever or someone's refusing us to get in, like you have to have your ducks in a row. And if you do have an emergency that you need to get in there for, and you do call the police, like have your stuff organized that I have before had to, uh, on occasion, there was a plumbing leak and the tenants wouldn't let, uh, the landlord in. And I attended the call and they were able to articulate it with paperwork that they had served them a day prior and it was an emergency and they needed to get in. It was taking longer. It was already longer than it should have been. They probably actually could have gotten under the emergencies. There's an emergency section. If there's like electrical or, or plumbing issues, like they actually waited longer than they should have. Mm -hmm. And we, as the police were able to go in and, and let the landlord in on that occasion. But it, it is very difficult. It's a very fine line and it's tough for us to, to deal with those kind of calls. Wow. Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah. So in Ontario, question, um, where do you get your comparable sales for the ARV? They were outside of New Brunswick, but I, um, I think that you can get com comparables from any real estate agent. Um, yeah, that's a good one. Um, yeah, just keeping a close eye on the market. So what do you do, Sarah, with Especially with the Burr, you need comparables. Like yeah. that's crucial. There's a few things I started doing recently um, <laughs> because the market is just like way whack out there. If you're gonna go in on a on a deal, chances are right now that you're gonna have to go with no conditions. So I started actually getting some appraisals done for the as is and then as complete, like when it's finished. Okay. A gauge of like what that looks like. So like. I just had like a private lender give me an ARV amount on a cottage that I wanted to buy because they like, they just are crazy all over the place. Um, but obviously like your realtor is probably your best go-to, but like you could actually just get an appraisal done prior and then you do your rentals and all that stuff. And then just make sure that you get the same appraiser if you like their number um, and have them come back. So I, I think that's like a great tip that if I can say, take something away today, take mm -hmm. that, do an appraisal as is, as complete, get the same appraiser to come back and appraise your house when it's finished and, you know, avoid or mitigate the risks as much as possible. That's a good point. We have another question. Do you buy, um, do you buy properties that make you assume tenants or strictly vacant possession? That's a tough one. Well, I don't, <laughs> I don't so much on multifamilies I'm, I'm building right now. So like we, we've always done our, like our vacants uh, on possession. Um, but I mean, if you're buying a multifamily, your chances are like, if it's as is already and you're not converting it, you're likely assuming tenants. Yeah, it's very hard to get vacant possession. It doesn't matter where, um, which is part of the reason why we uh, invest in other markets where you can get rid of tenants if you want to. Yeah. So in, in Ontario, you are inheriting those tenants. It doesn't matter because... Uh, 
the owner doesn't want to get rid of them. It's going to be too expensive. They're going to have to give them like 20 grand to get or more to, 50 to, I've heard lately. to leave. And they might not even leave on closing. So, <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> so I would say mm, it, inheriting it, tenants. That's it. <laughs> Make sure that it works. And if your tenant is going to be a hard ass and I mean, you can try cash for keys, but technically you've got to take it as is with the tenants in there and hopefully you know, they're okay and it work, and the deal works as is. But, you know, cash for keys is what a lot of people are doing and, it, and that may or may not even work, right? They can no. choose. You have to be very so, like, careful. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's kind of a cash 22. It's not, you know, it's not the end of the world, but a lot of people, what I'm seeing is they're buying these triplexes with like rents that are 500 bucks instead of 1500. And they're expecting that the tenants are going to leave tomorrow and it's going to nope. be not that, it's just not that easy. No. So just, just, mitigate as much as you can and just know you may be stuck with the tenants as is for a very long time yeah yes and we have someone who said have you had a tenant pass your stress test but end up being a pest yes oh, yeah. <laughs> i mean people can still slide through the cracks but i will say like since the new screening measures not yet um but we've had like you know i would say the Sanderson, the first tenants, and then um, mm -hmm. I shouldn't put, in, shouldn't say house houses. I'm just, <laughs> I shouldn't say houses either. But Any property. <laughs> two or three in the very, very beginning that were. We had two, but we were able to sit down with them and negotiate a way to break the lease and work with them, and it worked out okay. I mean, it was close because we all know we have no absolutely no power. Like if those people didn't want to leave, they don't have to leave. And you got to go through a lot of work to get them out. But I think if you're just good with people and you just chat with them and you come up with a reasonable way and a, a, a nice way to work things out, like knock on wood, we've only had two and both of those ended up being positive stories. But um, yeah, like it, it could easily happen if you're not careful. Treat them well along yeah. the way. Just be fair, firm, consistent. Like it, it's worked out. But I will say you have a, if you have a doubt or there's a red flag, just don't give people chances because it'll come in, in our, in our opinion, it comes back to, to, you know, bite you in the butt down the road. Oh, yes. <laughs> Always a hundred percent. We have some more questions. What provinces do you invest in that it's easier to turn over tenants? So, so most provinces outside of Ontario and Quebec. Yeah. So yeah. This donut, <laughs> outside of the donut, the center is not good. <laughs> for that yes. it's good for many things like increase in value appreciation and it's not all bad tenants we have some awesome tenants in ontario mm -hmm. uh but yeah other provinces like out west uh, alberta but it's a, also a double-edged sword so yes you can kick them out things like that but there's much higher turnover as well because they can also leave much more easily so that's something to consider higher vacancy usually in those provinces where the laws are more landlord friendly. Mm -hmm. I, I think there's pros and cons in every single one. Cause, cause I, I will say like Ontario, we've got so much lift in comparison to the other markets. And oh, yeah. leave, we have control over which tenants we want. And we have like, they're like a dime a dozen and the market increase that we can do is drastic versus like you're going into another market. It's not, it's not going to be the same. Nope. No, that's so true. Uh, another question, some strategies on best estimating rental costs. So, I mean, when you do the burr, how do you estimate your rental costs? <laughs> With lumber and stuff right now, good luck. <laughs> I, I'm tough. I, like, I have a couple contractors on hand. I take some pictures of the properties. I send them the listings and I get like an average. Um, but I, I will say like prices have gone up about 30 to 40% of where they used to be. So you need to make sure. But, I, but here's the thing is, is ARVs also have gone up. 30 to 40 yeah. percent to be so it's like it's almost like a wash but then you just got to make sure that you're still buying at a good price because there's a lot of people that are going to bid up the market mm -hmm. and you still need to finance those renovations so you need to calculate the yeah. line of credit or yeah. materials whatever at some yeah. point there's some sort of financing and then we have one more question after how many cash flow positive properties did you realize you can make it to early retirement I mean, I think that's just very dependent on who it is, but um, I'm sure it, I, I'll tell you it helps that we have midterm and short-term rentals. Um, yeah, it makes better cash flow 
Yeah, it helps that we've been in the market for seven years. For us, we didn't really have any JVs. Um, that doesn't mean, I mean, you guys did it with, with using JV, so it's just different. But, um, you know, I think it, it, the, the whole saying, it's about time in the market, it's, it's very, very true. Yeah. Um, as your tenants turn over, you're reboosting the rents. Um, as you're changing your, you know, strategy, maybe to shorter term, medium term, you're boosting the cash flow at that point in time as well. Um, so I think it's a combination of, of a lot of things. But we were on the dock last year, and I'm like, why am I working 80 hours a week? <laughs> <laughs> what about you guys? Well, I think that's a really good point, but I think that cash flow uh, positive properties is not the only factor. I mean, you have to also think about the appreciation that you're going to be building up. Yeah. If you're thinking about retirement, so you're thinking about the end of the game and also the mortgage pay down and all the other factors as well. And then your expenses. So we went a bit different. We also looked at how can we reduce our expenses mm -hmm. to make this number come sooner so you collapse time? Maybe we don't need as much money to live on. And that's another option. I mean, lifestyle versus money. I saw my dad working 80 hours a week for many years and he enjoyed 10 years of retirement and then passed away. So it's always a reminder. I'm like, maybe today is my last day. So let's make the most out of it. <laughs> <laughs> so... Wow, we have a lot of people asking questions. <laughs> yeah. Guys, keep them coming. These are awesome. Yeah. So what are some strategies on scaling without JVs, mainly financing? So you could do, you could still do OPM and finance with other people's money. Yeah, the burr. <laughs> that's a yeah. good way. I mean, that's the thing, right? Is just work with your mortgage broker. You're probably going to get some HELOCs on your properties. You're going to ensure that like you're, you know, figuring out who your next lender is going to be, but just refinance, refinance, you know, as, as you're scaling and to do it the best is by adding some renovations so you can boost up the value. Um, but, you know, like you guys said, other people's money, you can use private money. You don't have to do joint ventures necessarily, but you could use money from different sources to, to help you. Um, and then you, you essentially go to the bank after it on refinancing, and then you can uh, pay off the private lenders at that point. Exactly, absolutely. Infinite banking as well. I'm going to start drilling that down everywhere. <laughs> but it's, this is crazy. So through life insurance, you can uh, recycle your own money. You can borrow the money you put into your life insurance and use it. You pay interest and you get paid to use your money and it grows. It's just insane. And then you don't need banks or private lenders or anybody at that time. So that does take a few years. On average, it's about seven years, but you can do this in parallel. So that stuff is uh, crazy. And that's our next project, Jennifer. Also, he keeps explaining to th this to me at the end of the day after a glass of wine. So <laughs> she still doesn't get it. <laughs> <clears throat> so they said, great answers. Appreciate you guys. That's awesome. Uh, hey, have... what, one more question. Sorry. In your experience, what cities are difficult to comply with building codes? Uh, that's a Sarah question. <laughs> I mean, I don't think it's like which cities are harder. I mean, there's some that are more delayed and there's some that are faster. Um, mm -hmm. Like I know a lot of contractors don't like St. Catharines because they are a little bit more difficult to work with. Hamilton's a little bit, usually a little bit more delayed. Welland's super easy. Um, work with your, with your BCIN designers. Um, you know, BCIN designers, the people that do the drawings, that do the permits, that go to the city, that get their approvals. Um, I would just suggest, like I'm big on delegating delegate that part out it is going to be the best i don't know 3800 bucks or whatever they charge <laughs> then because you don't mm -hmm. need to build the city and they can do all of the back the back you know background stuff for mm -hmm. you because the city it's who you know that's one thing a lot of people don't realize because I, I we're in ottawa we've heard that a lot from uh, people and it's who you know at the desk that receives the file mm -hmm. well there's also some provinces it. in which we um invest that don't have building codes they just go by the national building code so that's going to be a little bit easier because there's going to be less uh, restrictions, restrictions and, so. yeah and then some states as well so we're looking at we're investing in, in michigan but we're looking at florida and in florida just to change um hvac you need a permit so that's very different too so <laughs> so each market has their quirks same with parking yeah like you're adding a basement suite, Ottawa, there's some rules around parking. Some cities are more easy. It's just, uh, yeah, you have to do your research. And... For sure. 
Someone's asking coin laundry parking fee. Is that something you do, Sarah and Matt? Uh, no. not, not necessarily, but I would just say coin laundry, sure. I mean, usually multifamilies, um, you can do those. Like for like our, our properties that we do short term, mid term, we just include the laundry. Um, if you're looking at multifamily, you could do coin laundry. Um, if you're paying the utilities, if they're paying the utilities somehow, I would suggest that you could offer them uh, a fee to add a washer dryer per month. Because a lot of people go to like, check out easyhome.com or I don't, I don't know if it's .com or .ca, but Easy Home makes a fortune renting stuff. Yes. Yeah. A building and say, okay, do you want to rent a big screen TV for X dollars a month? Do you want to rent a washer and dryer for X dollars a month? Easy Home is doing it. Why can't we do it? I'm just saying. There's some, I think there's some really low hanging fruit there to boost up rents. Um, parking fee, you know, if, if you're in a multifamily property, you want to include parking, do it separately than your standard lease so that you can increase rents and you're not stuck with the standard lease RTA stuff. Absolutely. Really cool. <clears throat> That's great. Wow. Well, well. Thank you so awesome. much once again. <laughs> mm. Well, yeah, so thank you for joining us, Matt. Be out soon, all, for all of us. At some yes. point. Yeah, for sure. It's nice meeting you guys. Yes, absolutely. So I hope everyone enjoyed that. Um, have a great night, everyone. Go invest. Yes. <laughs> have a good evening. Bye. Cheers. Bye.